Peace, everyone, and welcome to What's Up, Brody? How you doing? I am Noelle Jordan, creator and executive producer for What's Up, Brody? In my career, I am a live event and touring lighting designer and stage manager. What's Up, Brody? was created as a safe space for the 12 million strong live entertainment and theatrical professionals. This is a place for us to come and talk it out about how this global pandemic has impacted our careers, our lives, and essentially our mental well being. Whether we're missing the life or looking for new careers, this is the space where we will talk about it. Today, we are joined by another amazing panel and mental health advocate. Now, I encourage everyone to engage in the live chat here on Protest Party TV. So, in today's episode, we're talking about weddings, birthdays, or a well-organized turn-up. Let's get into private and special events. Our moderator for today is Khadija Nimrod a Brooklyn native currently residing in Los Angeles. She operates her bi-coastal special event planning company, The Superior Collective, serving as its founder and chief experience curator. Khadija is an alumna of both Howard University and the Georgetown Washington University, where she's earned her bachelor's and master's degrees in international business and events and meeting management. Khadija's meticulous eye for detail and commitment, commitment to making the impossible a reality is witnessed by every client and vendor that she works with. Whether she's not orchestrating events, you can find her crafting specialty recipes from her new cookbook, Soul to Soul, traveling abroad, or serving in ministry. Khadija is also a proud member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. Thank you, Khadija. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm so excited. I think that this is going to be such a great episode. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Um, thank you so much for Protest Party TV for allowing us to utilize your platform. Um, we are so glad to be here. And I know Noel has worked extremely hard to put this together. Um, just a few housekeeping notes. Just remember that we are going to have um, a live protest B-roll going on. Um, so there'll be footage above us during today's discussion. But I would like to just get this party started and let's kick off this discussion. Um, so before we go forward, I want to introduce our lovely panelists. I was reading up on some of your bios and I'm like, wow, they are so great. So I'm so happy to have you all. Um, so we're going to start with Ms. Simona Noche Wright. Um, Simona is an entertainment publicist and a special events producer. She lives in Washington, D.C. with her husband and is a mother to four beautiful children. She spent 10 years of her career in the world of film publicity with majority of her film publicity co career at Allied Integrated Marketing, um, where she served as a publicist leading film campaigns on behalf of high-profile high clientele um, like Screen Gems, Universal, STX Entertainment, Sony Picture, you know, you name it. Um, after leaving her nine to five and jumping into mompreneurship, mother slash entrepreneurship, um, she co-founded and produced the nation's first conference for millennial moms of color, the Momference. She's currently producing conferences and special events for her hospitality and lifestyle clients as well as weddings. So Simona, thank you so much for joining us. I'm so excited to get to know you a little bit more and uh, as we go throughout this episode. Uh, <laughs> our next panelist is Stefan Barone. He is an MC, DJ, and event coordinator for Making Memories LLC Music. Um, and the MMC Entertainment Group serving in the New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut tri-state area. He has over 18 years of experience in event production um, from private events such as weddings, bar mitzvahs, bar mitzvahs, communions, you name it, um, and along with corporate events and fundraisers. He is also the CEO of Red Planet Records LLC, which is an independent record label producing festivals and intimate concert series for the label's artists. So Stefan, thank you so much for being here as well. <laughs> thank you. 
Next, we have Mr. Eric Wells, who is also, like myself, a 2013 alumna of the illustrious Howard University, HU in the building. You know. Um, he, is <laughs> he has served on the design team for some major shows, such as Dick Clark's New Year's, Brock and Eve, and Disneyland's 60th anniversary. He has also served as the lighting designer for his first web series called Adulting, directed by Miss Ebony Price, who's also a good friend of mine. Um, she's also the, he's also, excuse me, the founder and CEO of Lights Up Entertainment, LLC. We also have in the building, Mr. Ko Kai. He is an artist, producer, educator, connector of the dots, um, he's a preeminent improvisational, excuse me, vocalist, Grammy-nominated musician. Um, he's also featured on dozens of albums on the onset of his career, um, such as Gold Link, Terry Lynn Carrington, Omar Sosa, and more, as well as continuing to perform as a member of Steve Coleman's Five Elements, Ambrose, Akinuzeris, and Origami Harvest. Um, let the world know that your work is on fire uh, it's a combination of your life experiences filtered through DC, go, go, and the music begat from the African diaspora. So thank you so much for being here as well. Looking mm -hmm. forward to continuing the conversation. Um, and last but not least, we have Dr. Raji Banks, who is a mental health advocate. Um, she's a philanthropist and scientist practitioner residing in Maryland, one of my old hometowns. Um, she has dedicated the last 15 years to advancing youth development via the arts and mental health education. Super, super important. Um, she is a proud two-time graduate of, again, the illustrious Howard University and currently works as a school psychologist in Washington, D.C. So as you all can tell, our panel the lineup is amazing. We have some amazing people here. Um, so let's really get into it. I know here in episode six, we are talking about the private and special events sector, um, which is nothing new to so many of us here. Now, when we think about 2020 and we think about this year of pivoting, I used to be a dancer back in the day. I'm not going to, you know, toot my horn a little bit too much here. But when you think about the word pivot, you know, I haven't heard this word since then, but in, it just seems like in the year 2020, that has just been such a key word that we've heard over and over and over again. So when we think about the process for pivoting um, within special events, you know, we've heard that so many venues have now closed or they've been affected. So for those of you all who are within the private and special events sector, whether you're planning it or whether you're on the vendor side, how has it been for you and your clients? Um, and anyone can kind of jump in here. I'll just leave the, the floor open. Um, but if anyone wants to kind of just talk about their pivot process and how this pandemic and the process within special events has truly affected your business. Nobody jump all at once now. <laughs> I can go. Um, so obviously before this all went down, starting in March, you know, we had a conference. The conference was scheduled to happen in may we had all these moms flying all over we also had a bunch of red uh red carpets and screenings that were slated to um show before movie releases and obviously everything got covered uh canceled so i mean at one point i was so over the word pivot because it was like we had heard it so many times and it was everywhere um so it affected us greatly it really showed how fragile the entertainment industry was um and is because movie theaters were you know, shutting down and we couldn't have screenings and we couldn't do grassroots promotions anymore so in terms of a um a film publicist point of view we had to come to a sudden halt um and later decided to pivot to screen um online by partnering with different organizations and finding ways that we can still kind of increase the awareness of certain films that may not have come out on um the big screen anymore but we have to and show these movies on disney or hulu or netflix and things like that in terms of the mom friends um, obviously six, 700 moms coming together was not happening. So right. I think it, it is a difficult um, position to be in as an event planner because everyone is waiting on you 
and trying your your partners you have all these contracts that you've signed um with your venues with part you know with different vendors that were working you have attendees who had bought tickets and you, this is uncharted territory so pivoting you know wasn't necessarily easy to just um decide and say hey we're just going to cancel it and do it somewhere else because we had never fathomed the events happening, not the way that would typically happen, which is in person. So I think it was for, for me as a special event planner, it, it took a lot emotionally to figure out how to number one, balance people's um, money, because when people have bought tickets, <laughs> you're trying to figure out, well, what am I gonna do? How to really understand um, or make the decision that in the future contracts that you're signing you're really clear on what they right. mean, when you can cancel it, you know, having a good lawyer in the team. So a lot of the things that even as a great special events producer, you feel like you're equipped, this really opened our eyes. And I think although the reason why it opened our eyes was um, a reason that angered me, but it was a lesson that, you know, I feel like it was great um, to learn. So after making the decision, we decided to pivot um, and go and create our conference digitally, but I'll let someone else answer. But before you even just kind of move on, you, you're still dealing with a quality event. So you're trying to figure out, is it better to cancel it? Or is it better to um, use a digital platform depending on how it would look if you're watering down your event? It really, it really is a, a tough decision. And it shows how a lot of people in the future should give a lot of grace to people in <laughs> positions, because it's not easy um, with big conferences and concerts and Rockley City and the festivals and attendees only say, where's my money? You cancel, and it's right. like, there, there's moving parts here and it's not just easy right. to tell you to cancel. Right, no, that's that's 100% true. And like myself as an event planner, you know, I think at the top of the year, 2020, everyone was like, 2020 is my year. We have so many events booked out. And I just remember like after my last event in February and the pandemic hit in around March, I just remember cancellations coming in, postponements coming in. And like you said, it's one of those things where you wanna produce a quality event, but this isn't anything that either of us could have fathomed. Um, and someone said something, you know, a few weeks ago that really stuck with me and they said pivot or perish. And I thought that was so enlightening because it's like you either have the opportunity to pivot and to switch directions or you're going to perish or you're not going to keep up with whatever it is that's happening and you're going to be left behind. So everything that you said was absolutely valid and people really don't understand how much work it really goes into, uh, you know, being a special events producer. Stefan, what about you? Let's, I'm going to head to you, you know, right now. I want you to answer the question about pivoting and, and what that looks like for you. So I could definitely offer perspective from the private sector and then also from the record label standpoint. Um, and I mean, we think of the word pivot. I also like the word adapt, right? Because we had all right. the products, services that we, we offered pre COVID. Um, but then you really saw them pick up once the pandemic started. So you had all these weddings that went from a 25 grand wedding to a zoom wedding, right? So it's, it's like, all right, how are we still going to be involved with this? How are we still going to make it a quality event? So things like backdrops, tent setups with, um, you know, step and repeats in backyards now instead of in front of a venue. Uh, these are all things that we offered, um, but might not have promoted as much. Usually the, the big money makers for us in the private sector are the DJ, the photo booth, um, maybe some add-ons like sender pieces. So now we're focusing on, all right, how do we transform a backyard with maybe a 15 person party or a Zoom wedding? Even myself, I, I did my own wedding over Zoom and we focused awesome. on the backdrop. Um, so, you know, it, it was just interesting to see these pieces of our service catalog that we already were promoting, but not, maybe not as hard as, as the other services and, and kind of had to transfer over to them and adapt to them uh, so that we could continue to thrive somewhat in this business. Um, from the record label standpoint, definitely a lot of Zoom concerts, right? That was kind of like the go-to. Uh, so I have my younger brother, he's the, the debut artist on it and, um, you know, just getting a, as many opportunities as we can. It was, it was interesting because what we take on when we do an in-person event, it's a lot of work. Like I'm running to a shed, yeah. I'm, putting up, I'm getting to a venue four hours before, 
uh, you know, usually the breakdown, I don't leave until 3 a.m. and then I have to go back to a shed and load everything back up. So definitely easier on my part and we're reaching more people. So it's kind of less of an investment of time and effort to reach a larger amount of people. With that said, the impact might not be as strong. So where an in-person event, we could wow people in an intimate setting with some indoor sparklers and a lighting show. And that's like amazing to see a, you know, a smaller size artist at these small venues with that high production value. So we're losing a little bit on that end. But what I feel my younger brother has gained as an, as an artist, he has now more time to invest with his individual fans. So, you know, he might not be able to connect with everybody at an in-person show, but he can follow up on it and we could actually get the analytics after the Zoom chat or the webinar, we could ask for email lists. Um, so we're able to do more follow-up post-show. So that, that's pretty cool too. Right. Where if I was in a venue, I'm literally running around with an iPad trying to get people to sign up for an email list. So it, it's a little bit easier to obtain uh, the audience afterwards and have some kind of connection with them. Right, no, definitely. Um, that was actually a great point. Um, anyone else would like to chime in on this question about pivoting and the pivot process, excuse me? I was gonna say as an artist, I think the, the other piece too is um, this has allowed you to connect, like you said, connect it more with your audience, but also, you know, taking care of the, uh, what I would just say are the, the internal workings of your business, right? So all the things that I normally would let slide when I'm doing shows, because as a, as a musician, I made 80% of my income off of tours, right? So my tours are mostly, all, all of my tours were canceled. I had several in Europe. I had back-to-back -to -back European tours. I had special events out of LA at the, um, at Disney Hall, I was doing Wayne Shorter stuff. Like I had all this stuff and then I was like, yo, I have nothing. And so, or do I have nothing or do I have Tuesday? So as a musician, you know, as a, as a vendor in this, in this space, then, you know, sometimes the show gets canceled. Sometimes the things that you can't control what people would call acts of God or just acts of, you know, yeah. bad decisions. Um, and so, right. And so you have to learn to, to make a move uh, in that situation that still best preserves your, your reputation and, res and, and best preserves the product that you're giving out. Right. And so right. what is, what is peer, what does peer to peer look like when you can't be in the face of those peers is what I started thinking about. It's like, yo, I can't be there in person. So what's the next thing yet? Yeah, well, 2d is 2d is definitely different than 3d, right? Looking at me on the zoom screen is how do I make that a fly event? So that's when I'm starting to learn, you know, more than just the, you know, green screen background. I'm learning what's the bells and whistles that I could put into a on, you know, a, a, a on screen uh, Zoom com uh, concert, right? Or if I'm pre-recording it, how do I make it more interesting? You just don't want to see my face on the screen. What if I put in some clips? What if I do some other digital things in the background? What if I mix it up? What if I make it more of an art piece? than a performance, a classic performance. And so I think that's the, the things that, you know, I personally had to, to learn. And then I had to think about what does that future look like? Because I don't foresee, I'm not trusting nobody's vaccine this year. So what do I foresee as the next, you know what I mean? So what right. do I foresee is the next steps in providing that? So, and it also helped me to, to run back to the connections that I already had. So all of the institutions, right, Smithsonian, Kennedy Center, um, uh, Jazz Gallery in New York, all of these institutions were looking for people who are able to provide content. So I don't look at myself as a musician, you know, or a vendor in that. I'm a content provider. So how, what sort of content can I create right now that I can best meet out to the public? And the public and my audience has changed. So my audience isn't just a specific demographic of individuals that will come out and drink at a club. Now it's the specific individuals that have time to sit in front of their computer. Right. No, that, oh yeah. I feel like you all have given such a plethora of amazing information. One thing that you mentioned just now was that, you know, now that things have kind of slowed down, it's given people an opportunity to really hone in on their business operations, on the back end things. A lot of things that would have, you know, might've gotten overlooked or we probably didn't have enough time to. Now it's like, okay, how do I really, hone in on this to make sure that I'm solid moving forward? How right. do I revise my contracts? How do I 
right. um, revise my business operations, my operational agreements? How do I make sure that, you know, moving forward in the future, who knows when this, when this is going to end? What does that look like moving forward? So that was a really great point. The other piece, too, is to, to kick it to Dr. Banks is I've been seeing my therapist more often. Hey. So how about that? That's another Love piece. It. <laughs> yeah. um, I was sitting here thinking like everything that you all share, I can actually relate to because no one understands uh, this pivoting game. And let's be clear, schools, special events happen every day, all day. That's, that's literally what a school is. And so um, as I was thinking about the phrase pivot or perish, literally that that's our motto. Either we had to pivot and we're still pivoting within schools um, and think about our audience. Like kids need to be entertained, um, even more so in a way than adults. Uh, I always say it's that fun and fundamental education is so important. And so literally today, as I came into this Zoom, I'm thinking about all the events that occurred today via Zoom um, and how our teachers have had to, the bells and whistles have had to use different platforms um, and of all ages, right? Because when we think about the younger teachers, they may be a little bit more hip and able to do it, but our older teachers are actually collaborating more with our younger teachers so that they can also master the art of cahooted, uh, make right. use of the different platforms so that they can actually reach the kids because if not, we'll lose them. And we've right. seen that in, in other ways and trying to figure out how can we pivot again continuously because also we're working with the parents now in the home, um, having conversations with them like, no, you're not homeschooling, but we do need you to be a learning manager and helping to make sure that this event, right, their school day is successful. Um, and so one other thing as people are sharing their answers that I think really comes to mind because while pivoting has obviously you know, it's been at a great loss to the business, right? The finances, um, remembering that we're doing this because we're in a crisis and we care about people and we don't want them to get sick. And so that is often the reminder that I have to share with our young people when they're like, I'm bored, when can we come back to school? You know, <laughs> because they realize they had more fun when it was 3D than they are yeah. now that it's 2D. But the reality is, is that, you know, we really have to think about the health of, you know, our, our, our audiences, the people that we work with. And so one, I guess it's not a statistic, but a, uh, what was asked by CDC, when you're thinking about considering if an event needs to be postponed or canceled, uh, we think about the crowd size, but I've often been curious if we think about the, those varying risk uh, factor levels, because obviously it's not just about downsides in the crowd, but when you think about your populations, you know, are they typically the older populations? Do you, uh, make any more provisions, you know, with that in consideration, um, because we do that a lot in the school as well. Right. Absolutely. That's, that's such a great point. Um, and I love how, you know, you tied in the mental health component, which is super important. I think just with everybody being home and just things changing and transitioning on so many different levels, we tend to neglect that our mental health is just as important as our physical health, you know? So what does that look like? Um, we kind of touched a little bit on this already, but I want to talk about, you know, processes, right? So there's this term, when outside opens back up, when outside opens back up. I remember back in March, I had this conversation with a friend and I was like, I want to go shopping. Should I buy like outside clothes or should I buy clothes for like in the house? Because I really don't know how much longer, but when is outside going to open back up? So I want to ask you all, like, let's talk about these processes, you know, with your business, with, you know, events, with whatever it is um, in terms of your everyday life, right? What processes have you now implemented um, as a result of this pandemic? And are these temporary processes? Are these um, more permanent? Are there any things that you think that you want to implement moving forward? Um, and what are your anxieties about outside opening back up? Whether they're, you know, bad anxieties like the interaction with people, or do you have any hopeful expectations for when outside opens back up? So this question is for anybody. Anybody can just kind of chime in. Um, so yeah. All right. So. I'm hopeful. I am hopeful, I'm, but I'm practical and, uh, about people in these vaccines. Um, but I'm a, you know, I'm a holder, uh, a, a lifelong holder of hand sanitizer, and I'm gonna keep a fresh mask on me. Like that's gonna happen. These N95s are gonna get this work. 
Um, <laughs> like clockwork. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I was in, actually, I was invited. Uh, one of my mentors in the band, Steve Coleman's band, actually, he was like, yo, do y'all want to go to Europe? Like in November, if there's an opportunity, because you can fly through Ireland and, and go do it. He was like, basically, it's no competition, you know, whoop de whoop. And I was like, well, nah, hard pass. <laughs> um, and the only reason I did it is, you know, made sure that I said that it just didn't seem, I mean, some of the things that were there. So there was going to be consistent COVID testing. We were not going to be in any hotels. We were going to rent a house. We were going to have a private driver that was going to sanitize the vehicle every day. So this is as a touring musician. So we would operate out of one central city in the South of France and then drive to whatever gigs needed to happen all throughout, you know, mostly through lower sections of France, some parts of Italy, Spain, whatever. Um, but there were just some other factors there like insurance. What happens if, if, you know, if somebody gets sick, how are you going to quarantine? How are you going to isolate? Um, and so those are the questions that I've begun asking myself. And I think those questions have poured into everyday life. I'm shooting a documentary uh, for Amazon next week. And I already hit them. The first thing I said, I'm like, yo, this would be great. Oh, man, I can't. I'm looking forward to it. Y'all coming through with them COVID tests? Like, <laughs> you're going to make sure they're solid because, you know, as soon as you come in, you're going to get the pss, pss, I'm hitting you off. Fresh <laughs> off break when you walk in the house. Like, that's going to happen. I need them results. I need that paper. I need that negatory on that thing. I'm negative. You're going to be negative. We're going to get it in. I'm not slapping hands. We ain't talking a lot. Six feet. I'm pulling out the tape measure. Like, it's going to happen. And not to be annoyed, but just to be real. Like, I think that, but, you know, I was thinking about it today. I was thinking about, because um, I was in the Walgreens yesterday, and this lady was like, you know, COVID is a joke. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to go with this. If um, if it was a, a, a possibility that, you know, even if you don't believe something is real, if there's a possibility that somebody else can get hurt, right? That I think that's the part that resonates with me. I have to think about other people getting hurt. So even if I, you know, I love performing. Per performing for me is catharsis. Like I love going to events. I love putting on events. I love designing, you know, events. Everything that I do, you know, I did create creative direction for uh, GoLink and for my man Guillermo Brown, who's a drummer on James Corden show. Um, I love making stuff and I love being around people, but I also have the empathy about other people, making sure other people are okay. And so I think the number one practice that I have is to be as empathetic as possible about whatever situation I'm going into to make sure that other people. So if, if I put that energy out there that other people are gonna be okay, hopefully they're putting that same energy that I'm gonna be okay out there. That's really good. That's so important. Um, Eric, let's, let's, let's hit you off with this yeah. one. What are some of your anxieties about outside opening back up or what are some of your hopefuls? And uh, let's talk about maybe some of the processes that you're continuing or starting to implement um, with the notion that outside will be opening back up. Sure. So um, aside from being a lighting designer and production manager, um, my side hustle when I, when I was full time was I was, uh, I am an uh, EMT, an EMT for the city of Detroit. So some of the practices that I do for work, I naturally do at home. So check my temperature. Um, I got a COVID test last week and the week before, because I think every month we have to do one just to be sure we're not infecting people that need help for another reason. Um, okay. I see personally myself doing that, um, at least until a uh, reliable, vaccine comes out, like Okaya said, I'm not, I'm not about that first vaccine life. I'm not gonna be nobody's guinea pig. Not, not, we're not about it. We're not about it. Um, right. And hand sanitizer is also another big thing um, that, that I plan on keeping around. I got two packs of Lysol right now on my counter that I'm looking at. I will be, san I sanitize everything. Um, and just, just, um, and honestly, I see those things just taking temperatures and making sure everything is more sanitary. Um, I see those being a lot more um, in, I see those are being a lot more ingrained in, in just events and other things when outside opens up. So just, just in case, cause nobody wants to be responsible for anybody getting sick or anybody getting COVID or anything else for that matter. Um, and it's, I think that's pretty, I think that's pretty important. And I think those things are going to stick around, honestly. Anyone else want to chime in with this one on your anxieties for outside opening back up some processes that you want to implement? Uh, so 
I was going to speak a little bit on a recent um, client that reached out and they were asking me about uh, doing a particular event coming up in October. And, you know, even though I'm eager to get back to work, I, I'd ask them, I said, okay, is it a kid's party? Do I need to bring games? And they're like, yeah, it's just a little backyard party. I'm like, okay, well, you know, how, about how many kids are you thinking? So like, oh, about 50, 13 year olds. And I was like, that's not a little backyard party then. Um, so I was kind of stuck in this position of, all right, I'm eager to get back to work. I know if this job goes out to somebody else, most likely that's, that's who they're gonna stick with. So I might lose my client to another vendor. Um, but it really, you know, as, as I sat there thinking about it, I have a mother who, you know, is in remission for breast cancer, leukemia. Um, I have a wife that I live with. So I really had to think there's no amount of money, uh, no matter how many future parties I might lose, that would be worth that. So instead of losing the work, I just passed it to somebody who didn't mind taking that risk, was eager to take that money. Um, you know, so we still kept it in house, but it just makes me think, I, I think outside of the New York City area, it kind of feels like it is back to business as usual, which is a little, a little bit fearful for me. Um, so I, do, I think everybody in this industry has to kind of take a look at what you're comfortable with, because I think people are starting to resume whether we like it or not. Um, it's unfortunate that people are not taking the proper precautions, but um, you know, it's, it's really, you have to assess your, your own risks and assess if it's worth it to you. And sometimes the money is just not worth it. Thank you, Seth. Right, and that's actually, I was going to say that. Sorry, but I'm so glad he touched on that because I, things are seeming like they're going business as usual. I wish I could show uh, the database that Johns Hopkins has been working on where other countries who have literally shut down. So I'm hopeful that we'll return, but we have not shut down. Let's be all the way clear. Um, right. I'm great, and I went back home. It was an emergency. I had to go back home. But unfortunately, I mean, where I grew up, Greek town, no one was wearing a mask. They're all walking around partying. It, it, business as usual. Um, when was this? This was August. This wow. was August. Mm. Retail mm. was popping. Um, unfortunately, I mean, and so even though restaurants were closed and they moved, you know, because more um, establishments are entertaining the patrons outdoors, I didn't see any social distancing. Um, and listen I, I was walking through the streets like okay it's time for me to go back to maryland um because they're just those hot spots and um right. i work with a lot of, of college students as well when you think about the push i mean even our leadership of the country was really trying to like reopen those schools but what was the plan um and the process and so for me while i am hopeful much like you all, I'm not trusting the first vaccine. I'm not going to be one of the first to go back to the school. I was already fearful of the heebie-jeebies before it was COVID. Of the kids, right? <laughs> would have to take those precautions. Um, right. So essentially, I, I think we, you know, I'm hopeful that we'll actually have a proper shutdown so that we can um, reopen and, and get back to business as usual because it does generate a lot of anxiety. And I think I was mentioning as far as the undergrads, you know, even the colleges that opened up and shut down within two weeks um, because of the rising cases uh, that are occurring. And so uh, I have a neighbor who's a virologist. I mean, his, his uh, prediction is that actually the college students will be the one that may, you know, have our leadership realize, like, let's shut this down because the conversations are not being had about how important it is that we take care of ourselves first so that we can, uh, allow our businesses to flourish flourish later. And so the college students that are just going on their freshman year, they're hosting these hot box parties and they're mm -hmm. passing you know, the germs on to each other. And they're literally, and no one is talking about that. So the, it can be very misleading to think they're like, oh, things are getting better. Are they? Right. They're just finding another mm -hmm. loophole around it. Mm -hmm. um, and Stefan, you kind of talked about this and Kokai, you kind of talked about this as well, but um, you guys kind of segue into the next question, but, you know, say you're dealing with a client who wants to have an event or wants to book you, you know, for a tour or for a show, or, um, they want to hire you for your services. And it's like, they're not really taking the pandemic that serious. And, you know, they haven't really implemented all of these protocols, but the bills have to be paid, you know, rent is due, mortgage is due, um, how do you find that balance between, and this is for anyone, um, but how do you find that balance between, you know, you need to pay the bills, but also your health and safety comes first. Um, what does that look like? That doesn't really sound like a balance to me. 
If right. you if your health ain't if your health ain't right, ain't no bills getting paid. You're gonna be laid up out of the way. <laughs> right. So it's like, you know, it's about priorities at that point. It's like, do I wanna risk getting getting paid, going on tour, being exposed to hundreds of thousands of people that you don't know if if it's in this building, if it's in this venue, this person has it all for a paycheck to to give to somebody else. <laughs> Is it, is it, is it, at that point, you got to ask, is it even worth it? Yeah, I think it's just, it's, that's super OD unnecessary, like in real life. It's not, it's no, there's no, I'm a cancer survivor. There's no amount of money. I'm not trying to tip out of here without my kid, you know, leave my kids because Pops is out here like, yo, let's pay the, like, Bill, I go with my dad. My dad's an old Brooklyn dude. Bill's going to be, hey, Brooklyn. Bills, bills are going to be <laughs> Bills. They're going to be here. Somebody gonna get owed something. So everybody can wait. I've been having a whole lot of yo, can you wait? Conversations with some <laughs> of the people that are like, like it's a whole smack pandemic. Like there's a pandemic. Can you wait? Like, I got you, just not right <laughs> now. Like, I'm gonna get you right. a little bit, you know, but there's other ways too, like the PPP, you know, you can go ahead and try and get you one of them loans, you could do whatever you need to do. You know, but or you could just like um, have a little bit of faith, like some faith might help. Like, you know, God, give you, you know, God make doctors, too, you know, and smarts. <laughs> you know, So you don't have to go out here and put yourself, you know, in, in harm's way unnecessarily. Um, and I don't know what that, you know, it's nice to get back to doing what I would want to do. But, right. that's, you know, that's real. That's mad selfish. Trying to right. deal with what I want to do. So. And to just jump off of that a little bit, a lot of people don't know this, but mortgage forbearance is a thing. If you need to take a beat to get yourself together and make sure that you're doing the safe thing to get things paid, you got mortgage forbearance. If you got a house, you got uh, you got rent forbearance. If you pay in rent, then you can take a renter's forbearance and you don't have to worry about that for a little bit. Like there's, even though for the most part, the government is doing a crappy job handling this, they there are some things that are built in naturally for something like this. And my biggest thing is take advantage of it. There's a lot of take advantage of it and also let other people know because there's a lot of things that people don't know about this thing that's happening. Right. There's music right. cares. There's music cares for musicians too. Like you can if you you don't have to be a Grammy member or any of that. If you are a musician and you've been working and you can justify the fact that you've been working or have worked prior to COVID-19, they will give you some money and pay your bills. Like they don't even give you the money directly. You can send them a bill and they will pay it. Leading off with you, Kokai, what are some um, practices or what are, what are some changes that you feel need to be made for you personally as an artist um, that would ensure your safety, that would ensure your crew safety, as well as the safety of, you know, other artists. And also, Stefan, I think you can kind of touch on this as well. Um, what are some things that need to change in order for you to say, I feel comfortable taking on this event right now? I mean, what, it all depends on the venue, right? And, and shout out to all the venues and everybody that worked at, at any venue that's in, you know, in threat of closing right now, because that's a, another sad piece that's happening. Uh, throughout the industry is all of the venue a lot of the venues have to shutter um, because they can't pay you know the rents um, for me personally I'm like yo what does the what does the green room look like how often is that saying like if we talk about live performance what's the green room look like who's going to spray that mic down like what's that mic looking like because I'm not going to just be running up on random mics it's not going to happen you know so who's going to spray the mic down you know what what does the equipment look like? The equipment rentals. If if I'm getting back line, where has it been? Who did the you know who did the cleanup on that? Like and then you know it's I don't know if I'm staying in. I mean I I went to a hotel for my anniversary with my wife, and we but we checked it out and they had a COVID certification and things of that nature. So I think if we're checking on that and then for my own folks, I'm making sure that band comes in with COVID tests. Make sure you got on a mask. Make sure you're wearing your gloves. You know. I'm going to make sure my people are responsible and hopefully the venue um, is making sure that they're responsible. Um, I was going to touch on, so some things that I want to continue to implement that kind of started through this whole pandemic. Uh, Pre-COVID, people would come up to the DJ booth requesting drunk leaks <laughs> in my ear, my eyes as they're, they're giving me song requests. Uh, so one of the things that, that we came up with to adapt to that with, while we're starting events back is an iPad kiosk. 
So if you mm. want to make this phone request, one, it keeps you away from us, but two, we're also capturing your email at that same time. Um, so does that really stop anybody from coming up? No, people are still trying to come up and, and they do the pull the mask down to, to speak. I'm like, nope, nope, like stay back. Um, so I want to continue to, I think that the masks are, are one of the best things because I would constantly get sick because I'd be out till two in the morning and then whoever, I'd be in contact with over 50 people, you know, yelling in my ear, uh, trying to speak over music. So I, I think continuing the mask, I, I feel comfortable doing that for as long as I'm working in this industry. Um, on the private sector, oh, not private, I'm sorry, on the, the record label side of things, um, for artists, I just want to say a model example of adapting to this, uh, there was a Bad Bunny concert recently that went through Bronx and came down into Harlem. Now, obviously, we can't all do it on such a large scale like that, but I do like the idea of doing something different out of the norm that still keeps everybody at a distance. Uh, so maybe moving more to you know, outdoor venues and things that are within our control. So I've been to plenty of venues recently that you know they, they tell you that these are the guidelines, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the, on a day-to-day -day basis, they're following them. It's really up to the individual how they're going to implement that. Uh, so just kind of transitioning more over to events and performances that are, that are more within our control. So even if that means, um, you know, purchasing a little bit more backline and having the speakers ready to go and, and us being able to set it up, we were kind of already moving towards that anyway. We, we have our own mics. I don't like how venues mics sound on my brother. So kind of just moving more towards things that are within our control. This way we could control who we interact with and then hopefully setting up events in that fashion. That's great. Um, I wanna transition a little bit and pivot, so to say, to Simona. Um, so as a wedding planner, as an event planner um, within the special events sector, you know, in 2020, as you can see, everything has pretty much gone digitally unless you're doing like a small intimate event, but um, what are your concerns for transitioning to um, the digital events? Um, and also, how do you feel about that pivot? How has that affected you? And, and what does that look like for, for what you do? I mean, obviously, you know, a concern is the uncertainty of it all, you know, not knowing what next year, not knowing what tomorrow is going to look like. Um, it, we're obviously a little bit more relaxed than we were in March, you know, like in March, everybody was like gloved up. felt like there was a dark cloud over us. And now I think we have adjusted a bit more, whether even if it's you're always on Zoom or you're home, whatever precautions you're taking. I think we've, we're still not used to what's happening, but we're, we're a bit more comfortable. Um, as a special event, I, I'm very, I think this has really challenged us to be creative. Um, in, in, in with weddings, not necessarily even being on Zoom anymore, but yeah, let's with, talk about that. Talk about weddings. How that, how does that pivot? Yeah. So with these things? like small scale, um, weddings, that's, that's actually been a way where wedding planners have pivoted and are providing packages now and glamorizing that. So instead of presenting your um, services in a way where it seems like you're settling. I think this is a where the clients are settling. I think this is a time for event planners or anyone else who has a service to really take a look at what they have and what the overall goal is for the client and figure out how to bridge that gap by being very creative because yeah it may not look like it, it used to be with 200 weddings that's not happening so it's either that shut down so now it's like until that ever happens again where you're at right now do i just sit home and just don't do anything at all or do i challenge myself as a planner to come up with different ways outside of zoom because personally i'm over zoom parties like march april <laughs> I have kids, we had a Zoom birthday party. I'm like, okay, enough of that. So how can we um, create an experience and package it in a way where I'm still getting paid and I'm still putting value in what I'm providing and still supporting vendors. So like the florist and the backdrop person, um, really looking at outdoor spaces versus the typical hotels and um, other indoor venues, you know? so trying to see like your limitations as more of a challenge of how can I be more creative in this space, even as a publicist, a film publicist. Um, now screenings with screenings, typically you, you plan it, it was easy, it was turnkey. And it was almost like we were la not lazy, but we were used to it. It's nothing <laughs> like, hey, this movie's coming out, let me find five partners and do it. But now we're thinking, well, how can we do 
and we're bringing outdoor movies back again. You know, the drive-in movies as well, so we yeah. can be creative and still have a screening, but um, in a drive-by, uh, outdoor drive-in movie. You know, so the goal is like, what is the goal here? Like, what is the limit and what is the goal? And the limit is that I don't have a movie theater, but the goal is I need someone to watch this movie to spread the word. So what, between that, how can I be creative? I know I'm more comfortable being outdoors. I know you kind of also want to educate yourself on exactly how you transmit, how you get the virus, because you can Lysol every day and you can still be close to somebody and get it. So that's just not even just the only way where we're gonna wipe down this theater, that's great, you know, but like, what can we do? Are we comfortable outdoors? Are your clients comfortable outdoors? Um, you may not have a 200 person wedding, but how can my client still have, depending on what your state laws are, is it 50 people that's the capacity? How can, how am I educating myself on what's happening? What's the limit? And then I can package it beautifully so that my bride can still feel like, wow, this was a magical day. I was able to have 50 people and still um, have the rest of my guests tune in. I was able to still get my dress and the florist and all these backdrops and still find outdoor chic venues um, to put together. How? I mean, now masks are a thing. You can brand masks. Like yes. the favors are the hand sanitizer. You know, like I'm currently right. pregnant and I had my baby shower mm. this weekend and I didn't want to do a Zoom shower, you know? And I didn't want to do a caravan drive-by because I'm like, I'm not standing outside for y'all to be driving by or waving. I may miss y'all, don't know who it is. So how can I still, you know, see people in a safe way, but still celebrate the fact that I'm still having a baby, right? The limit is right. I can have a traditional shower, but the goal is I still want to celebrate my baby and get my gifts, okay? So how can I do that? So I have a beautiful backyard. What I did was instead of a two-hour shower, I did a four to five-hour block where I had, um, I spread it out. So instead of my 80 guests in one place in two hours, how can I spread out 80 guests in five hours? So I'm like, here, you have a time block. You know, I know DC, you can't have more than 50 people. In my backyard, in order for us to be six feet and safe, I can't have more than 15 people in my backyard. So how can I divide these people to come 15, right? And use clear language to make sure that they're staying six feet away from me, but also still you support my vendors, bring balloons. My I had a whole COVID kit bar. People can't eat while they're there because I don't want them taking their mask off and eating, but I had to go boxes for them to still eat. So how can I still create this baby shower experience where you still felt like, oh, I went out. I saw my friend Simona. She's pregnant. I saw other people. I left with a favor. I left with food. I was able to drop off my gift and do all that stuff. So I think, again, understanding I mean, the virus is still be, but understanding, kind of keeping tabs on, okay, what exactly is my understanding of the virus? What are my personal risks? You know, I'm pregnant, so my risk is certainly different than somebody else who may not, you know, be pregnant. I have children at right. home. I have a daughter whose immune system is compromised. So my, my limitations are a little different, but what can I do that makes sense to me that still brings me joy? And it was such a hit and I had so much fun. And it just reminded me that, for as long as we're going to be in this, again, the, we may not like the reason that we're in it, but for us to be standout publicists or special events or whatever field we're in, we have to know, like, when things change like this, how can I be creative so people, the goal can be met and I can still, you know, collect my check so I'm not falling out of this business. Amen. Right. So even a question for you, Simona, again, if a client comes to you and they're like, say it's your cousin or a friend of yours and they want you to plan like a private dinner or like a small engagement for them. Um, and they want you to be a guest at their event as well. Um, do, how do you go about that? Is it something where you're like, I can plan it, but I can't be there or I can plan it, but everyone there has to have COVID tests. Like how do you navigate that um, in that space? Right, so I think for me, like if let's say a cousin did come up to me 
I would, again, plan it as they were a client. But as of now, again, I am aware of my limitations. So I cannot be sitting close indoors with people that don't have masks, especially people mm -hmm. I don't know. So right. your negative test means nothing to me because I don't know what you did after that. So I think just kind of being aware of, I have my own pods and my own boundary circles and there are my own girls that I can sit with in my backyard and I feel comfortable with that. But if there is somebody who's come, I can plan it for you for sure. But me and my team, I would ensure that, you know, we have masks on, we're far away where we can do what we need to do and you can enjoy yourself. I think it's where, you know, it's where you are as, as a planner and, so, and people should be able to understand and respect those boundaries. You know, it's not offensive. You know, everyone has different boundaries. So even if right. a client comes up to you, it's not even necessarily like, hey, they don't take the pandemic seriously. We just may have different boundaries based on, how because I'm sure I, I think I take it seriously, but I know some people who are home all day, every day. You know, they've never stepped outside and they could probably mm -hmm. look at me and say, Well, heck, she's pregnant <laughs> and she still has her four friends around her, and I don't believe in pods, you know, and they can think I'm not taking pregnant. So I think you just kind of have to focus on yourself and do what, what works best for you and communicate right. that to your clients clearly. And if they don't understand that, then, um, <laughs> no amount of money, you know, you don't make right. that I mean, we're not surgeons, you don't make that much for us to be out here dying for some events. So even though I've seen this post before and it's like the world's top five most stressful jobs in event planners and surgeons are definitely on that list together. So we might not get paid as much as them, but we sure do a lot a lot of work. Okay. <laughs> So I want to wrap up with our last question, um, and this is for the Save Our Stages Act. So it's a bill that authorizes the Small Business Administration to make grants to eligible live venue operators, producers, promoters, talent representatives, um, to address the economic effects of COVID, right? Um, and so how do you think that the private events industry could benefit and be eligible for this bill, for the Save Our Stages Act? And anyone could go ahead and, and answer this. Not all at once. <laughs> I mean, I don't know the, the parameters of what they need to be el eligible. I think that they should definitely um, participate. I think that I think that the the smaller venues are going to need more assistance uh, first than the larger venues. Oh, I mean, I, you know, I don't know how people do, deal with their money. So am I looking at saving Songbird or am I looking at saving the Anthem, which is the Anthem is a, is a super huge mega uh, venue in DC. I love it. It's a little 300, you know, 300 joint with a homey feel. So do, you know, who's, I don't know how to grade those venues. Um, but I, you know, I would hope that if there's enough, uh, in the coffers from the city for especially DC when they got all the speeding ticket money that they would go ahead and throw a little bit to the venues um, and, and and try to hook them up. Um, yeah. But I do have a question for Simona. Did you did please tell me you did the branded masks? Did you do that for your baby shower? Simona? Uh, I don't know if she can hear. It's probably the internet. Simona, can you hear us? Yeah, I can now. Sorry, wait uh, for a second. I'm saying, did you did you do the branded mask for your baby shower? I sure did. That's I what did. I'm talking about. Okay. Branded mask, branded hand sanitizer, branded everything, branded yeah. champagne flutes, everything. <laughs> Yeah, it's so funny. I'm actually doing a dinner for a client, uh, I want to say next weekend, actually. So we're looking into doing the branded mask. I think that's definitely the trend now. Like you have to be masked up, but do it in style. So for sure. Um, anyone else has any input that they want to share about the about the act or anything else in regards to this conversation? Raja, I think I saw you saying something or Stefan. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Dr. Banks, please go first. Sure. Um, so, I mean, regarding the Save Our Stages Act, um, I certainly think that private event industry, um, that this will be applicable to them. Um, as I think about one of the things Simona mentioned about um, making sure that what you're comfortable with, right? And one of the things that you have to think about is that as well as having empathy for your patrons and um, being able to communicate, you know, the needs or the whys behind why uh, the event um needs to be altered the way that it needs to be and so possibly i mean i think 
collaborating with uh, other mental health advocates and professionals. Um, we have certainly, I know I've been called on to come into spaces to kind of, you know, couch the conversation um, for employees, you know, who may not understand why things are happening. As I mentioned earlier, I, I do it with students and families all the time um, because it'll be a, a consistent thing, right? This has been going on since March. And so I don't think we're going to ever get used to this is going to be a constant thing. So kudos to you, mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Walker, for having a therapist um, and kind of using, you know, those opportunities to encourage um, and support mental health, you know, for your patrons um, so that they can kind of wrap their hands around why things are shifting or, because they're in a way they're pivoting as well. Um, just as much as the business is pivoting, they're pivoting as being okay with, you know, the details. And I think Simona really did a great job of bringing that to the forefront. Um, you don't have to look at it as taking a loss or um, mm -hmm. things being watered down if you know you are really specific about the details. And psychologists, mental health professionals are, are very much so all about the details, especially when it comes to health. So I certainly hope um, that even some of those on some of you on the panel are, you know, can possibly take uh, use Save Our Stages Act to your advantage. If I have time, um, you do. <laughs> okay. So uh, a concern of mine with with the act is I want to make sure that it's equitable for everybody. So I want to know how do you become eligible? And I think um, without snitching on anybody, a lot of people within this industry are making money off the books. So everybody's taking cash. So it's if they're going to base it on uh, you know your last year's income that you reported. I know a lot of musicians, of friends of mine, might not be eligible for it. So I'm concerned. Um, how this act is going to be rolled out. Uh, I also don't want to see any sneaky wax stuff, you know, snuck in at the bottom of it. Um, so I, I'm just interested in the particulars, which we haven't seen yet. Uh, but that's something to be aware of that, you know, a lot of people within this industry, especially the musician side of things, they might not have reported that income or the 1099s might not reflect it as highly as they may have actually earned in the previous year. Um, so that, that was my major concern with that. No. Wow, guys. So I know we are short on time here, but I just want to thank you all so much for being a part of this amazing conversation. As an event professional, I've certainly learned so much from each and every single one of you. So thank you so much for your time, for your insight, um, and just being so willing to be here on this platform. So for everyone who else is joining with us, uh, we will see you again next Tuesday on the same time, same platform, Protest Party TV, where we're going to be discussing music festivals. Um, I know Noelle jumped out. I think the internet kicked her out this time, but thank you so much to Noelle Jordan for bringing us all together. Um, we are super, super grateful that you called every single one of us to be a part of this conversation. And we thank you yeah. so much for everything that you're doing. So on behalf of Protest Party TV and Noelle, I just want to thank you all again. And let's definitely stay in touch. Thank you, guys. For sure. Thank you. For sure. Peace, peace. Peace. Bye, guys.